like to introduce our final speaker of today, Jennifer Papa Constantino is a graduate of the Institute of Holistic Nutrition. She graduated with first class honors and in addition to her nutrition training, she participated in a mentorship program studying the philosophies and teachings of Dr. Bernard Jensen, completing certification courses in clinical iridology, live blood cell microscopy and base allergy therapy. She is an energetic and dynamic nutritional professional and is the founder of Heal Naturalistic Health, which is a thriving practice that she runs in the East End and also virtually, where she offers complementary therapies and evidence-based clinical nutrition to harmonize our beliefs and practices of a balanced approach to lifelong health. Jennifer teaches nutritional symptomatology part one, nutrition and health through the lifespan and also the fundamentals of nutrition. Let's welcome our beloved faculty member, Jennifer. <laughs> Thank you for that introduction. Thank you so much. Uh, so to all of our participants here today, um, thank you for coming and showing up on a Saturday afternoon. Um, I just wanted to say that um, uh, I started IHN, I'm a mother of four, and I started IHN in the part-time evening program in 2006. Uh, and uh, the education that I received there uh, changed my life, uh, not just um, my health and the health of my family, uh, but also my uh, career direction. So um, I'm so happy. Uh, Elizabeth's never been able to get rid of me. Uh, that's why I'm still there. Uh, so, you know, 16, 17 years later, I'm still hanging on. And uh, now I'm happy to uh, have been teaching for the last uh, 13 years. Uh, so today I would like to talk to you about nu nutritional strategies for digestion. And uh, again, for uh, the question period at the end, please put your questions in the um, question box. I will also provide you with my website and my email. Uh, for those of you who would like the PowerPoint presentation, I'd be happy to send it to you um, uh, if you just want some notes on it. Okay, uh, so uh, we will get started. Let me just open my, um, my PowerPoint and start it. Slideshow from current slide. So today we are going to be talking uh, everything about digestive health. Um, you know, I could actually talk about this for about uh, uh, three or four sessions in class, but uh, I've been given, you know, about a 40 minute talk today. So we're going to make it, uh, we're going to pack it full of stuff uh, as much as possible that I could get in uh, during this open house talk. Uh, so there's the correct spelling of my last name. I do apologize. My maiden name was also 16 letters. Uh, so this was the least of the two evils. Um, and uh, you can find me at healnaturally.ca. So let's go on. Um, so the digestive system, uh, for those of you who maybe have never taken anatomy course, uh, you're not really sure about the intricacies of digestion. Um, here is an image for you. Uh, and uh, it's actually quite intricate and detailed. So when we think of digestion, we just think of chewing and food and poop. Uh, but there's much, much more to it than that. Uh, this is also known as the alimentary canal or the GI tract. Um, and basically, uh, we're going to talk about digestion and what occurs from mouth to anus and uh, things that can happen anywhere in between that. Uh, so this is an image here um, of the digestive system. Okay. Uh, and as you can see, there's there's way more to it than than what meets the eye originally. Uh, so it includes everything from the mouth, you know, our tongue, our salivary gland, um, the, the liver, the pancreas, the gallbladder. Um, and of course, we also have the small intestine, which is the largest portion of the um, intestinal tract, and then the colon. Uh, and then um, of course, there's a difference between chemical digestion um, and mechanical digestion, which we're going to talk about. 
So uh, one thing that it doesn't mention here on this slide, actually, that we also want to consider is there is kind of a, uh, a, a component of digestion that's uh, less talked about. And this is the digestion that happens uh, before we even, before food actually hits the mouth. And so this is kind of like brain digestion, let's just say. So oftentimes, you know, if you haven't eaten for a length of time and you start to think about food, maybe you took out food out of the freezer that you're defrosting for later on. Uh, maybe you had a plan for dinner. Um, you know, maybe you're going out with friends for dinner. And what happens when you start thinking about, you know, ordering food or preparing food or consuming food or just the thought of food itself. Um, and, you know, things start to happen already in the body uh, with just that image and that thought. Uh, and so it's often said that digestion begins in the brain. Uh, however, if we um, look at kind of a um, definition of digestion, it's the uh, breakdown of food into smaller components. So that definition obviously doesn't include what happens in the mind. Um, but, you know, you start to salivate when you think about food. Um, you know, your stomach may start making noises. And so I want you to think about that component, too, as we're going through our presentation today. So there's definitely, uh, um, you know, something to be said about priming the engine of digestion. And for those of you on this platform who may be old enough, um, you remember what you had to do in your car before fuel injected engines, right? Before you turn that key, especially if the day was cold or the car had been sitting for a while, you had to pump the gas to prime the engine. OK, and so thinking about food, preparing food, smelling it, touching it, you know, uh, massaging your kale and and, you know, the cooking of food and steaming of vegetables and all that. There's something to be said about the interaction here that a lot of people miss uh, that we don't discuss. Uh, and so let's talk about kind of uh, the um, ins and outs of digestion here. Uh, so we have uh, mechanical digestion. So. Uh, we're going to follow food from kind of like uh, mouth to anus here um, and talk about the mechanics of all of this. Um, and so the first thing that needs to happen is we chew our food very thoroughly. Um, so mindful eating is especially important here where uh, chewing of the food, uh, there's a type of chewing called Fletcherizing developed by uh, fittingly named Dr. Fletcher where he said you should chew your food no less than 31 times. And um, uh, uh, if you have really bad digestion, you could sit there and chew it 100 times. And this is mindful eating, okay? Where you're actually slowly um, liquefying your food before it goes down into uh, the, the throes of digestion, okay? Below the mouth. Um, and then when food goes down the esophagus into the stomach, there is the churning of the stomach that needs to occur. Um, and so this happens for about two hours, it takes about two hours for food to go through um, the stomach, and then it gets pushed into the small intestine. Um, the small intestine is quite long, anywhere from 15 to 20 feet of small intestine we have, um, which we're going to discuss a uh, healthy small intestine and strategies for that. Um, and so what happens here uh, in the small intestine is called peristalsis. And this is a wave-like motion that happens with the musculature uh, of the food through the small intestine. Um, and sometimes people do have problems with digestion because they don't have the churning of the stomach or the peristaltic action of the small intestine. So there's specific nutrients required for muscle tone. Um, namely the B vitamins as well as potassium. Uh, so these are very, very important. And of course, proper musculature happens there. So as you can see, there are um, a lot of uh, mechanics that need to happen here right from the mouth all the way through the system uh, in order for digestion to occur properly. Um, and let's spend some time talking about the chemistry of digestion now, uh, because again, this is very intricate. 
Um, and we spend a lot of time in class talking about the uh, chemistry and the physiology behind uh, digestion. Um, Dr. Bernard Jensen uh, put a lot of his work and life um, uh, research on the digestive tract. So uh, he was known as like the bowel doctor. Um, and if any of you don't know, uh, we have a few of Dr. Bernard Jensen's uh, books uh, that we are, are required text in the program. And uh, Dr. Bernard Jensen, his legacy um, when he died, and he actually unfortunately died from uh, the side effects of a, a secondary car accident. So uh, he recovered from the first, but as he was recovering, he had a, another unfortunate mishap in his, in his vehicle. Um, and uh, at the time of his death, he had a sanitarium in California where he healed over 350,000 people from chronic degenerative diseases uh, using natural approaches. And so he talks about that in his books. He's also known as the father of iridology. He developed iridology as we know it today. Um, IHN has a continuing ed course in iridology that you can look forward to. It's just an adjunct or a modality that you can add on to that. So I actually am a certified iridologist. Um, and that was one of the first modalities, uh, you know, upon graduation that I went and learned. It was, it helped me help clients and it helped me assess clients. So uh, back to the PowerPoint here, uh, the chemistry of digestion um, uh, in the mouth, uh, our, piddle, our uh, oh my gosh, I forget the name of the gland, parotid glands, <laughs> it started with a B, uh, our parotid glands and we have salivary glands actually produce and excrete salivary amylase. And so again, with this chewing action uh, that needs to occur and many people just eat too fast. So that can actually impair digestion right from the get go. Uh, and so we produce saliva and the salivary amylase you can see on the slide here will start to digest starch. Uh, and then in the stomach, uh, our stomach acid also known as HCL or hydrochloric acid um, actually starts with some of the breakdown of protein. Uh, it activates search, certain enzy enzymes and, and proteases called uh, pepsin. And uh, this actually uh, begins digestion, okay, mouth and stomach. Um, you see here uh, in the green uh, on the slide, you have the liver and the gallbladder. Uh, the liver in the hepatocytes of the liver, we produce bile which is stored in the gallbladder. And this is where fat digestion occurs. So this is for the emulsification of lipids. Um, and then very, very importantly uh, is the pancreas. So now the pancreas is a very interesting organ or gland. It's actually an exocrine gland and an endocrine gland. Uh, so in terms of endocrine, it secretes insulin and glucagon which are hormones. So this is the only gland in the body that actually has the ability to produce endocrine and exocrine um, substances. And then its role that we're gonna focus on today that it plays in digestion is the role of the pancreas. Uh, and so it secretes amylase, which digests starch. Um, this should say amylases, there's more than one. Uh, lipases, which digest fat. Um, peptidases, which digest protein, uh, nucleosides or nucleases, which are very important for um, our body's DNA and RNA, and then it secretes bicarbonate, which will neutralize this uh, acid coming from the stomach. And then in the small intestine, uh, which is uh, kind of that banana one shaped pink one there, um, we have uh, the ability to produce and excrete something called brush border enzymes, uh, which will actually break down carbohydrates. So you could see this process when we say digestion, it sounds so simple, right? Uh, and it's very simply a nine letter word, but it's this very, very intricate process that occurs in the body. So I have a quote on here from Dr. Bernard Jensen um, the number one source of misery and decay we are witnessing in society today is auto intoxication or self-poisoning caused by bad 
microorganisms and metabolic waste and other toxins in the body. So at IHN, we have a course called Nutrition in the Environment, uh, where we talk about our exposure as humans to a toxic world and a toxic environment and everything that we're bombarded with from the outside. But if you don't digest properly, um, this is called endotoxins, which are toxins that are generated internally, or, uh, also known as autointoxication, which is the accumulation of endotoxins in the body and uh, or, uh, you know, and of course, metabolic waste. So if you don't digest properly, if any of these digestive chains are broken in any way, shape or form, it actually can lead to illness. And we can create sickness from the inside of our bodies, not just what we're exposed from the outside. And, uh, you know, uh, the medical paradigm on here on this is that, you know, we're always, oh, they're always looking for an expl explanation, what caused, you know, our angst or our disease. And, uh, you know, we're looking at viruses and bacteria and parasites and all of these external factors. Um, whereas uh, the germ theory has been disproven where we have to look at the internal environment, okay? These external bugs will always seek their favorable environment. And that could be created internally from improper digestion and other reasons as well, but mostly improper digestion, but all other reasons can include, you know, things like impaired detoxification or, you know, not drinking enough water or having enough fiber or binders and things like that. So we always want to look at digestion central to uh, our cause of dis-ease here or dysfunction in the human body. And there are so many factors that affect digestion. Uh, so this is a short list. Um, obviously, I could probably have a couple slides on this. Um, so number one, poor food choices. So garbage in, garbage out. Okay. And, you know, even sometimes the healthiest food if it's particular to that individual and it's not something that is uh, something that your body is in need of, uh, so this doesn't necessarily mean junk food, uh, but of course it could, uh, but it could also mean food sensitivities uh, or food allergies. So there is a saying that one man's food is another man's poison uh, in the sense that you know, we uh, are all unique and biochemically unique, like a snowflake or a fingerprint. And one food that's good for me may not be good for you. And one food that's good for you may not be good for another person on this platform. So take that into consideration here, is that we need diets that are biochemically unique. We very uh, stress the importance of uniqueness at IHN. Uh, where treating digestive systems, uh, digestive issues also has to be unique to the individual. Uh, so eating too fast and insufficient chewing and eating on the run and eating very quickly um, definitely can have a negative impact on digestion. Uh, low water and low fiber, okay, or any type of deficiency here uh, can affect the body negatively. Uh, low intake or low levels of nutrients in the body. So we're going to talk about which nutrients are very important for digestion, food allergies and sensitivities. Um, stress is a factor. So in the body, uh, we have the somatic nervous system and the autonomic nervous system. The somatic nervous system is everything that you think about. So, you know, me doing this and flapping my mouth, I'm thinking about that. Okay, my brain's going and I'm doing this voluntarily. But we have a, a branch of the nervous system called the autonomic response, which governs everything in the body that doesn't require thinking. So at this point, this is your heart beating. OK, this is salivation. Um, you know, this is circulatory and hormonal and things like that. And digestion is regulated by the autonomic response. If your body is in a sympathetic system, uh, where you're in this fight or float, flight mode, okay, you're diving, you're in a hurry, you're rushing, you're thinking about 12 other things, you know, you got to get your kids off to school and you're late and you're rushing and you're putting food in your mouth, you're not digesting that food, okay? Uh, bottom line is uh, resources, when they're redirected 
uh, by the autonomic system into like a fight or flight um, mode, you are not, uh, the body is not prioritizing digestion. And then there are certain medications, uh, you know, ones off the top of my head, antacids like Tums and Rolaids, um, H2 antagonists, proton inhibitors. Okay, there are a lot of digestive based medications uh, that actually can impair digestion. And it doesn't have to be a digestive based medication. It could be uh, something that you might not think of like the birth control pill has a negative effect on digestion. And we can uh, talk a little bit about that. But, uh, you know, and then there's like neurological or uh, nootropic medications that affect the output of the brain and the vagus system and the nervous system. Um, and so there's uh, something called hormonal digestion as well, where a lot of um, processes in digestion are actually regulated by the hormonal system. So just some things to think about, you know, putting that out there. Uh, so, you know, it's not limited to what I have on the slide here. So let's follow digestion from mouth to sev or from mouth to anus. Uh, so some things that can go wrong uh, right off the top is you don't chew your food, you eat in a hurry, you eat while you're thinking of other things, and uh, then food goes down into the esophagus and possibly you don't have enough stomach acid. Uh, so reasons for low stomach acid or low hydrochloric acid, uh, the, the correct term for this is called hypochlorhydria, is age. So sometimes it's not your fault at all, okay? It's something that just occurred as we age. Um, so the time in your life when you have digestion of steel, when you should be able to digest nails and um, or anything that you put in your mouth, for that matter, is in your teens and in your 20s, okay? So in youth. Um, and so it has been shown that as we age, after the age of 40, uh, stomach acid levels and digesti digestive abilities uh, tend to have a tendency to diminish and slow down. So there are things that we could do to practice preventative here. And then uh, it's shown that after the age of around 40 to 50, uh, digestive juices and fluids uh, reduce by about 50%. And after the age of 70, digestive fluids and juices actually uh, diminish to about 10%. Um, and, you know, like, you know, all you have to do is flip on the TV and look at a commercial for any digestive um, support, uh, you know, like Metamucil or laxative or things like that. They are catering to an elderly um, uh, demographic there. Okay. Um, there are certain cofactors or accessory nutrients that are required in order to produce stomach acid. Uh, these include zinc and iodine, um, many of the B vitamins in the B vitamin family, as well as sodium and chloride, sodium chloride. Uh, so, it, you know, for hydro, in order to produce hydrochloric acid, you need hydrogen. You also need to be hydrated. Okay. So water, drinking, um, you know, have enough fluids in your body. Uh, so we talked about stress already. This fight or flight response um, will impair uh, the body's ability to uh, accept food and be ready for food and digest food. Uh, now, another thing that uh, you know we can actually kind of like fatigue our digestive system by eating the wrong types of foods. So diets that are very, very high in um, animal proteins, um, also refined grains, okay, so very high uh, gluten diets can actually impair digestion um, and enzyme void. So any type of processed food, food that has a very long shelf life, we typically call these dead foods. Um, you know, there's something to be said about shopping the four outer corners of the grocery store um, where you get, you know, more living foods and then anything in between there you want to take a look at, you know, so foods that have a very high shelf life. Um, that maybe haven't been sprouted or dehydrated and they're enzyme poor. Um, and they actually put a very taxing, over, um, over taxing response on the digestive system. And they're very difficult to digest. They require a lot more work from enzyme systems, from the stomach, you know, from the pancreas, from the small intestine in order to 
break down into something that we could use for fuel. And so the main reason we eat is actually to provide the body with um, uh, nutrients that we can, you know, that kind of fill our fuel tanks and keep us going on a day to day basis. Uh, be careful about chlorinated water. Um, again, they talk, we talk about water filtration um, uh, and quality, you know, uh, in holistic health, we focus a lot on quality. Uh, and so it's not just a matter of being hydrated, but what is the quality of the water that you're putting into your body? Um, possible um, substances and medications that will um, inhibit stomach acid or neutralize it. So antacids like Tums and Rolaids and Gaviscon, things like that actually neutralize acidity in the stomach. And we actually need that acid. It's actually one of the only beneficial acids that's produced by the body that is necessary for life. Um, and then there's medications that people can be on. Um, I mentioned them before, H2 blockers or proton pump inhibitors. And these medications actually block, um, I, you know, certain uh, chemistry in the body, a proton pump inhibitor and block, it blocks the little pump in the parietal cell, which are cells that line the stomach uh, that actually produce HCL. Now, also be careful what you decide to put in your mouth because there are uh, certain things that have a very uh, strong negative impact on digestion. So coffee um, or a caffeinated beverage of any kind. So this could be also pop, you know, like Coca-Cola or Pepsi uh, or Mountain Dew, you know, these caffeinated beverages, black tea um, and nicotine actually cause digestion to speed up and go too fast. And they cause the stomach to empty before it's ready. Uh, and so they actually have like a laxative effect on the stomach. Coffee can cause peristalsis, which is this contraction of the muscles in the intestine uh, within four minutes of, of consumption. And it actually will help us uh, have a bowel movement. Now, should you need a caffeinated beverage or a, 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 a cigarette or a cigar or something like that to have a bowel movement, the answer is no. This is a natural process that should occur on its own. If it's not occurring on its own, there's something broken along those lines. There's something going on, okay? Uh, so coffee also releases stress hormones and keeps the body in this fight or flight response. The opposite of fight or flight is rest and digest, which is where the parasympathetic nervous system has kicked in and it allows for the food that we eat, we need and the, uh, that we've eaten to digest properly. Um, also, there's an issue with uh, a direct correlation with cigarettes and smoking and um, the strength of our esophageal sphincter. Uh, so these sphincters actually open and close and they regulate how food is passed through certain areas of digestion. And um, it contributes to uh, stomach acid and reflux or backward flow of the stomach contents to uh, reflux back up into the esophagus and cause what we know as heartburn or GERD which is gastroesophageal reflux disease, okay? And then when food leaves the stomach, the next thing that needs to occur here is we need the gallbladder, which is a, a sac that sits under the liver to actually uh, secrete bile. In order to do that, the gallbladder needs an acid trigger, okay? Uh, so this acid trigger obviously comes from the stomach and, uh, uh, again, you know, we talked about different reasons for the ability to produce. Uh, sorry, guys, I have like a hair or something tickling my nose and I keep scratching it. Um, and so what happens is if the food leaves the stomach too quickly uh, or there's not enough stomach acid for a variety of reasons, uh, there will be a very low bile secretion. So the quality and the quantity of bile is now uh, very poor. And uh, this can cause uh, issues or malabsorption with fat. So one of the ways to know if your gallbladder isn't working properly, look at the color of your stool. It should be a nice uh, dark chestnut brown. Uh, if it's gray or orange or green or you know a, a weird different color, then you may not be producing bile. Stool in the toilet should sink. It should sit on the bottom of the toilet, not on the top. And therefore, if there are floaties 
then uh, that could be an indication that the gallbladder is not working properly. Um, uh, of course, pain under the right breast, because uh, that's where the gallbladder anatomically is located, um, or shoulder pain or joint pain in the absence of injury are all indications of uh, impaired gallbladder function. Uh, and so when the contents of the stomach leaves the stomach without sufficient hydrochloric acid, this impairs bile flow as well. So reasons for low bile, um, again, we go to hydration or dehydration rather, um, not enough water intake. Um, the cholesterol lowering medications actually impair bile flow and not enough of a nutrient called lecithin, also known as phosphatidylcholine, um, are very important for uh, the gallbladder. Uh, there are also three key nutrients needed by the uh, liver to produce and excrete bile. Um, one is an amino acid called taurine, uh, a, a vitamin B6, as well as magnesium. Now, uh, Women are more prone to gallbladder issues than men for the simple fact that um, estrogen fluctuations and hormonal fluctuations have a negative impact on the gallbladder. Uh, so women uh, in their um, uh, pu pubescent years, as well as menopausal years, can actually, uh, you may see that they've had uh, gallbladder issues or the gallbladder removed. Um, I might also state here that um, uh, I've seen very often when a woman is pregnant and digestion changes during pregnancy because the, um, uh, the fetus is causing the digestive system to be all bent out of shape and in different anatomical places in the body and the liver and the gallbladder gets pushed up and under the uh, rib cage there. So pregnancy can be in factor here, but one of the number one antagonist to proper gallbladder health and bile health is uh, the birth control pill. Okay, uh, it's the number one cause of gallbladder disease in females. Uh, the reason being is because being on the birth control pill for uh, three consecutive months causes a severe depletion in vitamin B6 as well as magnesium as these two nutrients are required by the liver to detoxify synthetic um, or excess estrogen, okay? And the birth control pill is 21 days of estrogen, which impair uh, hormonal flows and balance and ebb and flow of progesterone and estrogen and testosterone and things like that. Now, um, you know, I just wanted to make a note on this slide here. Uh, hard calcified gallstones will show up on an ultrasound, but if you uh, had or suspect gallbladder issues, and you've had an ultrasound and nothing show up, I just wanted to make note here that soft gallstones will not show up on an ultrasound. And so the ultrasound could be considered clear and you still suffer from, you know, the deleterious effects of having gallstones and you don't know what's going on and, you know, you just don't feel good, digestion's not right, then it could be that the stones are not, they haven't been there long enough, they're not hard and calcified. Okay, moving down the digestive system here, uh, to the pancreas, uh, this slide speaks for itself. Okay, so we talked about the pancreas secreting enzymes. This is an example of that. And the pancreas secretes enzymes in response to the stomach acid as well. Okay, now the small intestine is 20 feet long. And this is where most problems show up. Meaning the problem isn't really here or it's not necessarily, we call this in holistic health, a deflection where you think the problem's in the small intestine, but as you've seen, you know, chewing, liver, gallbladder, pancreas, stomach, all of those things um, are responsible for keeping the small intestine either sick or healthy. And so a lot can go wrong here. Um, there is a phenomenon called leaky gut um, or candidiasis or SIBO, uh, you know, bacterial overgrowth in the intestinal tract, but you got to go north to make sure that all of those things that we've talked about thus far um, are in place and working efficiently and purring like the engine out of a Porsche before you worry about what's going on here, okay? So I know a lot of um, protocols function at this area, but we want to make sure that um, 
you know, we're working on the north end of digestion. And then a lot can go wrong again with the bowel. So chronic uh, bowel diseases like IBS, Crohn's colitis, and constipation are all side effects of issues that happen on the north end of digestion. Remember, digestion from mouth to south. Very oftentimes, when we're dealing with matters of the bowel, we got to go upstream, upstream and figure out what's going on uh, with digestion. So just in the last couple minutes that we have here, um, I have the five steps for digestive healing, some of the um, supplements and things that we that can help us. So in the stomach, we can put in uh, supplements that mimic hydrochloric acid. They're called betaine HCL. Um, for anyone without a gallbladder, they need to be on bile salts, okay? Um, in symptomatology part one, we learn clinical protocols for how to keep all these organs healthy. And if the organ or you suspect the organ is not working functioning, functioning properly, um, then we uh, give you clinical protocols for how to get these organs back up and running and the system running smoothly. Um, we can consider digestive enzymes. There are multiple different fiber supplements on the market. Um, I prefer, rather than just a straight psyllium, I prefer a mixed type of fiber that has all different fibers in it, both soluble and insoluble. Um, make sure that your pH is balanced. So at IHN, in multiple different courses, we stress the importance of pH. This has to do with whole body health. Um, and of course, we discuss um, strategies for balancing out pH in the whole body. But pH in the digestive system is very important as well. So one way that you can improve pH is to take something called basic tabs or mineral tablets, basically, is what they are. It's calcium, magnesium, potassium, a little bit of sodium in there as well. Um, cabbage juice. If you have a juicer at home, cabbage juice is one of the absolute favorites of the digestive tract. Um, I didn't mention on this slide aloe, so aloe would be very good as well. If you have aloe juice or an aloe plant, the inner leaf is very good for the digestive system. It's a carminative, it coats and soothes the digestive system. Carminative, you'll learn in herbal, by the way. Um, of course, lactic acid uh, is very important. Lactic acid is produced um, and uh, actually we get exposure to lactic acid and lactic bacteria in breast milk. So how a person comes into our, our world is also very important. It has a lot to do with digestive health, um, food choices, which we've talked about, and multiple different um, options for probiotics and probiotic food, okay? Um, if you suspect an infection such as SIBO, parasites, uh, bacterial overgrowth, then you may require a remove protocol, uh, which is a technique or a program that we put together where we kill all the bugs in the gut and then we teach you how to recolonize. This is called the 4R strategy or the 5R strategy for digestive healing. And only then, if you suspect that leaky gut is an issue, can you heal this. So everything else that we've talked about here needs to be in place and supported in order for leaky gut to, um, uh, it, to be healed and reversed, okay? And then of course, support the stress response. Now, the question here is which diet? You know what, and to be honest, this really depends. It is a client by client basis. Um, I run a full-time clinical practice uh, in Pickering, Ontario, and I see clients day in and day out. And it is very important to not just get hung up on one diet for everybody. So really, which diet is best for digestion? Um, this really depends which part of the digestive system requires the most care and attention. So on the slide here, I've put some diets that we discuss and we teach and we go into greater depth um, at IHN uh, in the program. And so that way, you have the tools to decipher and work your way through which diet would be good for the client sitting in front of you or maybe for yourselves, okay? You're coming into the program wanting to heal yourself of you know, chronic issues that nobody's been able to address properly until this point. So some 
considerations here that you can look into is the AIP diet or the autoimmune paleo. Uh, it's a very um, really good diet for healing leaky gut and um, which the uh, leaky gut is, you know, the um, kind of the basis for autoimmune diseases. Uh, the simple carbohydrate diet is one. So we have a really great book in our program that we recommend called the Breaking the Vicious Cycle, written by Elaine Gottschall. Uh, the GAPS diet we talk about, and graduates can go on to become GAPS practitioners, uh, you know, and where you go and you go get further certified and trained and you specialize in things like that. So gut GAPS stands for gut and psychology syndrome. Uh, this was created by a neurologist named Dr. Natasha Campbell McBride. Um, low FODMAPs diet, so you've probably heard that FODMAP stands for fructo, oligo, di, monosaccharides, and polyols. And what you're doing is you're cleaning up all of these very difficult to digest foods, and you're giving your digestive system a bit of a rest or a break. Um, for those of you who are vegan, a ketotarian diet could be something that you would recommend or look into, uh, not necessarily for digestive healing, uh, but it is a strategy that you could use while you do some of the five, uh, five, st five strategies for digestive healing there. Um, and uh, of course, there's uh, the carnivore diet, which has gained more and more popularity in the last coming uh, few years. Um, again, you know, uh, these diets, some of them can be quite imbalanced in, you know, things like fiber that are good for the digestive tract. So um, not with, not really a long-term strategy, but something you could look into while you're working behind the scenes to heal the gut. And then there's a diet called the elemental diet, um, which of course, all these diets we learn about and more at IHN, so you can make their best recommendations. Okay, thank you so much, Jen. Always a pleasure, always pack-filled, awesome information. And uh, always uplifting as well, because uh, no matter what is happening in our digestive tract, there is always something that we can do to uh, make it optimal. Okay, so first question we have is, do you have any coffee substitute recommendations? Oh, absolutely. Um, I've actually never been a coffee drinker myself, luckily, because when I came to IHN, I realized the effects of caffeine on the body. Um, but I do recommend to my client, there's the Dandy Blend um, formula, which you can buy at a health food store. Um, there is Ticino. Um, there are mushroom options now as well uh, that you can bring in. Uh, Ticino is a caffeine-free, coffee-free uh, substitute. And I think there's different, there's instant and there's percolated uh, Ticino that you could use. Um, and so you can bring those in as an option. What are your thoughts on alkaline water? Um, alkaline water, uh, I don't like for digestion or for overall health or to boost yeah. pH or for uh, digestion. You, you know, so it depends what you're doing. Um, I do have to say it is quite an expensive option. There are other ways. Uh, so not everybody can afford an alkaline system. I know a, a lot of them run, uh, you know, very high. Uh, there is a debate whether drinking alkaline water actually makes you alkaline. So the current uh, science is showing that actually you become more alkaline by drinking distilled water. Uh, but we talk about all different um, options about water uh, in uh, a few courses. I think fundamentals, we touch on it. Environmental, we touch on it. And certainly in symptomatology, the course that I teach, we touch on that. So, um, you know, Alkalized water, uh, you know, are you talking about Fuji water or a Kangen system or just adding a pinch of sea salt? Obviously, there's different options for that. But, you know, uh, it's 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 debatable. It's debatable. OK, great. Um, you mentioned cabbage juice is great for pH balance. What about making an alkaline juice out of celery and cucumber? Uh, yes, uh, you know, obviously there's lots of different options for juicing. Um, in symptomatology, we talk about uh, D uh, Dr. Rao uh, is the father of new uh, biological medicine. We talk about new German medicine and we have um, alkaline recipes for alkaline broths. Dr. Rao's alkaline potato broth is in our course notes. And so there's obviously juicing options. 
You know, it doesn't have to just be cabbage, but the reason I put cabbage in there is because cabbage will, it's high in something called vitamin U and L-glutamine and methionine, which will actually soothe and coat and reset the digestive tract, which celery juice will not do. Okay, so that's why we use cabbage juice. So because my presentation was more geared towards digestion, I would yep. focus more on that. Oh, yeah, fantastic. And specifically for H. pylori, it's also incredible. H. pylori and ulcers, a liter of cabbage juice a day will heal an ulcer in under 10 days, right? It's yeah. amazing. Yeah, it's an absolute miracle. Yeah. Yeah. Food is medicine. It sure is. Absolutely. <laughs> okay, what protocol, what protocol or method would you recommend for seasonal allergies? Oh, okay. Um, well, number one, uh, a lot of allergies come from this uh, auto intoxication that we talked about. Um, where any part of that digestive system is broken and you're fermenting your food and you're putrefying your food, um, you know, and so number one, make sure you have enough stomach acid, um, make sure that you have uh, good enzymes and make sure you don't have a leaky gut picture. Um, but one of the strategies that we talk about in lifespan actually for seasonal allergies, because we have a whole uh, session on allergies, I think it's number three in lifespan, um, is, uh, using local honey. Okay. So go and find a beekeeper near you and, uh, a tablespoon of local raw honey actually helps with allergies. And if you do have like yeast or fungus or, you know, bugs in the gut, honey being a monosaccharide will not feed any of those bugs. Excellent. Okay. How do you, how does one know if they have low stomach acid or high stomach acid? Oh, that's a good question. Um, <laughs> so in symptomatology, we talk about doing something called the betaine challenge, uh, where you take the supplement betaine until you get reflux. But if you're at home, there's something called the baking soda challenge. Uh, and that's something you can do, uh, very inexpensively at home. And also you can do the apple cider vinegar challenge. Okay. And so those protocols we talk about in class as well as strategies to determine. However, um, I'm teaching um, today, I went over uh, um, some slides and topics that we actually talk about directly in symptomatology. And um, uh, where was I going with this? We use a question, a symptomatology questionnaire called the NutriBody analysis, which is a questionnaire that you um, uh, as a student have to fill out when you do your personal case study, but you will also teach you how to use this in clinical practice. And there are two scores on the NutriBody. One indicates low stomach acid and one indicates high stomach acid based on your current symptoms. Okay. And so symptomatology is basically a course on how to read the body's language and how to determine what it's telling you. Yeah. Excellent. And in regards to the cabbage juice, is there a specific type of cabbage that you're recommending? It does not matter. You can go and get it, but make sure it's organic. You don't want, because when you concentrate the cabbage, if you're yeah. putting any fruit or vegetable through a juicer, you're also going to concentrate the pesticides and the herbicides and the larvicides and the garbage that life is safe. So do make sure that it is organic, but it could be Napa cabbage. It could be red cabbage, green cabbage. It doesn't matter. Excellent. Well, uh, that is all the questions for today. Jennifer, thank you so much for your wonderful and beautiful presentation and being with us today on a Saturday. We thank want to you. thank everyone that joined us today. It was so nice to have all of you with us. And we are uh, blessed to be in this industry to learn this incredible knowledge to bring holistic health to ourselves and to the people that we love and to this entire universe. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.